Hi, I'm Todd Fryett with ECA Solar. I'm the president and founder of the company. We're one of the larger engineering, installation, and developers of commercial solar in New England and Massachusetts. Today, what I'm gonna cover is some of the big news we got a few days ago from the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources. In particular, my focus is gonna be a little bit more on the commercial side because that's my expertise. That's my background of doing this the last 10 years. I'm gonna go through the good, the bad, and some of the ugly. So first off, let's just talk about Massachusetts in general and the, and the solar market here. It's considered to be one of the most stable environments for solar in the whole country. We owe a big debt of gratitude not only to the current administration, the Governor Baker administration, as well as uh, Governor Volpatrick's administration, who really jump-started and got everything going in the first place. A lot of us, including myself, really missed the SREC program. That's really what put us on the map and what created so much scale in this in the space. But now as we transition to not only Smart Program 1, but now here Smart Program 2, which they've just reloaded. And the emergency regs just came out. They were filed on April 15th, 2020. And now there's a comment period between now and um, April and May. I'd encourage everyone involved, all the industry stakeholders, to file their comments. It can be done ver ver through email, and it's fairly easy to do. Um, clearly, the, the, the state authorities in Massachusetts, from Massachusetts Dewar to the DPU, to um, the other authorities, including the Mass CEC, they really uh, pay attention to this stuff. They take a lot of pride in the program. And it's one of the reasons why Massachusetts is a leader in clean energy and why we have so much renewables, um, including our RPS statute and other things that are supporting the industry. But I, th I feel very grateful to be from Massachusetts, to live in Massachusetts, to have a company that's based in Massachusetts, and to have the support we received over the years. Just a note and a disclaimer here, my opinions uh, are mine and mine alone. So you should rely on your own reading, on your own attorneys, on your own interactions with the state authorities. I am not a government authority and I should not be the last word on a lot of these comments. So on the good side, let's just start out with the obvious. Number one, the program has doubled. So there's now another 1600 megawatts of solar. It's going from 1600 megawatts to 3200 megawatts. Obviously that's a wonderful thing and that creates somewhat of stability in the industry moving forward. A couple of the other big changes in the program that we're really excited about are the following. Number one, they've changed the definition for public entity solar. Specifically, the adder has gone up to four cents per kilowatt hour. Again, that's 20 years and four cents per kilowatt hour for projects that involve a public entity. The biggest change in the program specifically about that is that you can now have sites that are pr on private land which have a public off taker. That's a big deal and that's a new change. We think that's a positive change and it makes sense because if a public entity is getting 100% of the output from a project, it shouldn't matter if it's on private land, public land, brownfield, whatever. The point is that 100% of that output is being attributed to a public entity. I assume, I'm not sure that that could be either alternative on billing credits or net metering credits, but needless to say, that's a huge, huge sweeping change in the program. A couple other big changes in the uh, SMART program that I'd like to share with you that came out, we consider in the good bucket. Um, one, they've expanded uh, the definition of low income, in particular, low income neighborhoods. So, you know, in general, the mean average income in our state is around $77,000. And what they're saying is 65% less of that. If you're in a neighborhood, call it, that has a mean income of around $50,000, um, that will qualify for the low income incentives. That's another positive change. Um, we're still trying to, as with all the other changes, we're still trying to get our head around it. This is just my rapid feedback. Another big one that we're excited about, and we really think they got right, was um, 
a carve out for small commercial projects. That's from 25 kW AC all the way up to a half a megawatt AC. And so what they've done is they've carved out a, a set aside for the incentive blocks, the declining blocks or the smart blocks for 20%. That's really important. I think that protects um, a lot of companies and builds more of a sustainable program as opposed to just being washed out by a handful of large projects and a handful of frankly large ground mounts um, in the middle of central and western mass. So that's a very positive thing and we're glad to see that change come about. Another important thing that we think the state got right or they're trying to get right, it's consistent with the state um, with their straw proposal is that they're not going to merge and give away all of Eversource's east, um, Boston area, Cape Cod, east coast, away to Western Mass. That makes sense. That's been consistent with what they said um, previously, but there's different rate payers here. They deserve, they're paying into the program. They deserve to get their fair share of the incentive. Also, the tariffs are extremely different. So you have a much lower net metering rate or um, alternative billing rate out in Western Mass, very different needs. Um, and so they've already eaten their fair share of incentives getting a full eight blocks. So that merger and blending should not happen. And it looks like they're protecting the first eight blocks um, for Eversource East and Star for the East Coast. All right, just getting into some of the land use stuff and some of the category one um, changes that have been made in these emergency regulations for the Smart Incentive Program. Um, one that jumped out and that, that continues to be a large loophole is for previously developed land. Um, so you can, for your project, you can get into a potential category one if the land was previously developed. As you know, in Massachusetts, very old state, very old communities, very old towns. All these towns are over 400 years old. So getting into the nuances of what is previously developed is really important. We see that as a potential large loophole, maybe larger than they expected it to be. Um, but to some certain, you know, almost all the land you're gonna find was developed in some aspect. Also on the land use side was um, I think a loophole that they did not intend to create, which is that now um, public, uh, public entity solar projects, which can be on private land, automatically go into that category one bucket. I would suggest um, to do it in the DPU that that be just a focus on just public land. So it, land use shouldn't be based on who the off taker is, it should be where the land is. Um, I think that's a, probably a, a minor oversight and a loophole that will probably close during this round of edits. I don't think that was their intent, but since the definition of public entity solar has changed, I think the definition uh, for land use should be reflected. So it truly is just public land as opposed to private land. Another big positive change that just came out, which we're, uh, we think makes a lot of sense, is on the project segmentation rules. Uh, we think that's a very positive change. So if you're working on a property where there's three different buildings and you have three separate solar arrays on those separate buildings, each one of those has the potential to get its own smart award. There are some details and nuances there, but for us, if there's four major commercial buildings on one parcel of land, it is conceivable that each one of those, um, if they have their own interconnect and meter especially, would be entitled to their own SMART award. You know, in general, that's a good thing. That's not a change that as, it, as it was last time. What has changed is they're saying for behind the meter, instead of declining at a rate of 4% per block, it's going to decline at a rate of 2% per block. That's my reading. I don't know how exactly that's going to work. Um, but long and short of it is, we, they're still not doing enough to focus on behind the meter. There's a lot more that could be done. That was the second best category under the SREC program. And now it's still, there's just not a lot um, to incentivize building solar where there's load as opposed to building solar on ground mounts in the middle of Western or Central Mass where there's absolutely no load. Um, so you're gonna continue to see the program dominated by a lot of those projects.
Also, if you're behind the meter, your solar incentive will be fixed from the get-go. So it's pretty simple in terms of calculating what that is. But at the same time, there isn't an additional incentive other than that to be behind the meter. They're not doing enough, we don't think. I think the heart's in the right place. Um, on the bad bucket and some things that could maybe use a little work, um, number one, the biggest point is that the state program in Massachusetts, uh, I think the one area where they really miss the mark is that it doesn't account for failure. It doesn't account for uh, incentives that never happen, that don't get rate based. There's hundreds and hundreds of megawatts of projects that are just never going to get done. For instance, some of the transmission studies that have come out, the New England ISO bombs that have been dropped across the state, especially in central western mass where they're just flooding these small towns that have five megawatts of load with 30, 40, 50 megawatts of projects. Those projects are never gonna get done. Even though some of them may have gotten interconnects for reasons we'll never understand. Um, and so the smart doesn't account for those failures. Even though half the program or a significant percentage of the program never gets done, never gets paid out, never gets rate based, it doesn't account for those. Those, those early blocks get washed out and they just assume that we live in a world where all those happen. And so unfortunately it doesn't account for that. It continues to decline 4%, 4%, 4%, 4% and go, it's a race to the bottom. Um, that's structurally one of the biggest mistakes in places that the state missed. We would say an easy way to deal with that is just decrease the decline. So say, hey, we've had an, a, a large percentage of projects the declining rate should be 2% instead of 4% or 1% or whatever that is. Um, that would be a, a fairly easy way to handle the awards moving forward and account for some of the fallout. Another big thing we think the state missed out on is mandating battery storage for all systems that are 500 kW. We think for a number of reasons that's going to create havoc with the utilities and with the developers. Number one, for projects that are already applied, um, or already have their ISA, they have to rip that up and reapply with a brand new, which means they could start in the, they could have waited years on a wait list, they need to start all over again. And so that's a huge problem. Also, there are some projects where batteries don't make sense at all. It could be behind the meter, there's no use for batteries. It could be a rooftop, it could be in an urban or industrial area where there's not even room for batteries. Or it could be in another area, let's say a brown for a landfill while bringing in some of the hazmat and some of the issues that are in batteries onto a site like that does not make any sense and is much more high risk. Um, there are other instances for rooftop, let's say, where it creates fire problems or issues associated with a building that really shouldn't be on the site and um, shouldn't be approved. So we think um, sort of a miss uh, mandating batteries and the carve out of the exemptions for those should be much more significant. One more area where we think the state has missed the mark is just trying to create some diversity versus having a ton of large ground mount projects, um, which a lot of the cities and towns are overwhelmed are. ECA Solar does ground mount projects, like we're in it too, but at the same time, if the program is 80, 90% ground mounts, you know, I, I don't think they've achieved the diversification that they're trying to. They say that the uh, subtractor for Greenfield has been dramatically increased, but in reality, um, it's just a small speed bump. It was super tiny to begin with, and it's still super tiny. It's a rounding area. It doesn't have a, a major impact on the financial models, especially if you can just get money back doing trackers, dual access trackers, or adding a certain plant like pollinators. So you can make it all back very easily, um, or a public ad or something like that. The subtractor tends out to be really modest and immaterial and is not going to have an impact on deterring large ground mounts that a lot of these cities and towns are fighting with now. So please feel to leave your comments below. We'd love to hear you, good and bad. I'm sure there's a lot that will disagree with, with my reading. I'm sure I've got some stuff that's not 100% accurate as well. This is just my opinion, my take on it. Thank you so much for joining. Bye.